Hello everyone and welcome back to the Damage Report. I'm John Iderola, very excited today, both for the news, but more importantly for the person who's going to be joining me to run us through this hour, Benjamin Dixon, here once again on the Damage Report. How's it going, Ben? It's going great, John, how are you? I'm good, I'm good. I. Uh, I don't know if it's just because I'm like over the hump of my cutting down of caffeine over the past few days, or if it's just because there's been a little bit of good news. But yeah, I don't know. Things are looking a little bit up. What do you think? I'm <laughs> I'm a little hesitant to accept the joy. It's been a great couple of days, particularly. Um, I didn't expect the gamer GameStop story to make me so happy, but it has. It really has. Mm-hmm. Yeah, now that has taken a turn that I'm not yeah. a fan of, but yeah. but we're actually yeah. going to be talking about that right off the bat because I have a feeling our audience is probably going to yeah. be interested. <laughs> so we're going to talk about that, but that's not all. We've also got, let's see, uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene. We talked a little bit about some of the crazy stuff that she has said and believes uh, yesterday on the show, um, but it's only a one hour show, so we couldn't get through everything. So we're going to have more for you today. Um, we've got some good news having to do with Bernie Sanders. We've got stuff on the minimum wage. We've got a lot. So uh, everybody, uh, buckle up, hold on to your butts. We got some news coming for you. Please hit the like button and share the stream if you haven't already, so that people know uh, that we're live. Um, and as we do this, if you'd like to chat along with us, send us tweets at hashtag TDR Live, uh, tweets, uh, twitchies, anything you want, uh, we'll respond to those as we go. Uh, I already see um, C Maslik. Welcome to Tier One YouTube membership. Appreciate that. Um, and with that, Ben, you ready to to jump into this thing? Yeah, let's rock and roll, man. Okay, let's do it. I'm really excited to get into this first story, especially because of a late breaking addition to it. So uh, let's do that. <clears throat> Over the past couple of days, a group of people initially led by a subreddit, um, uh, uh, Wall Street Bets, uh, successfully screwed a hedge fund over massively to the tune of potentially billions of dollars. And it was looking like that was going to continue. But we are talking about a movement to take on the most powerful entrenched economic interests in the country, or I guess the world and history, I suppose. So they're not gonna go down without a fight and they certainly aren't gonna fight in a non dirty fashion. <laughs> so this morning I saw that Robin Hood TD Ameritrade have restricted restricted trading of GameStop and AMC stock, among others. And it's not just them, by the way. Apparently, Charles Schwab did it. Um, I don't see it reported here, but I couldn't trade Nokia on Fidelity yesterday. So I guess it's going a little bit broader than that. So they've cracked down on this. And as a result of that, uh, the stock price of GameStop was plummeting. At least when I was checking, I can't say what it's at exactly right now. Well, actually, I, I, I guess I can't. I guess I can publish it right here. But <laughs> Um, let's bring up this chart and you'll see that it did lead to the stock price going down. It looks like it's recovered a little bit because I'm reading right now that it's at 243, but it was up above 350, 400. So uh, ju- we got a lot more, but Ben, so far, what do you think about the fact that these Robin Hood, TD Ameritrade have decided, no, you don't get to buy this stock anymore because we don't like the implications of it? It just goes to show us that these institutions had no intention in dealing with us in good faith, right? Because as soon as we use the system against them to beat them at their own game, they pull the plug on it. So um, that's okay. We're gonna just find new ways of screwing Wall Street over and over and over again, the way they've screwed Main Street over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I and look. I asked on Twitter, how is this possibly illegal? A lot of people are saying it's not. I'm not an expert on the law or stocks or anything. So I don't know, but I don't see how it's legal. Um, But anyway, uh, there are gonna be investigations. But first, we're all processing this. And um, so when I'm processing this sort of thing, first of all, I wanna know what Ben thinks. Second of all, the country (laughs) wants to know what Ja Rule thinks. So Ja Rule tweeted, Yo, this is an effing crime what Robinhood app is doing. Do not sell, hold the line, WTF. So anyway, I'm referencing a Dave Chappelle sketch there with Ja Rule, <laughs> but he apparently is concerned about what's going on with Robinhood. And it's it really is amazing because Robin and Robinhood is just one of the groups that's done this. It's not just them, but they sort of build themselves as we're gonna let regular people engage in this. They <laughs> called themselves Robinhood. You have an opportunity to be kind of Robin Hoodish, and instead they decide to protect the hedge funds. And so, yesterday on the show we had Dan Evans on. He's our informal financial correspondent. So he tweeted, 
How are you gonna call the app Robinhood and then protect the billion dollar hedge funds from the free market? Just rename it Bootlicker. <laughs> oh yes. Which is definitely true. Yes. Like <laughs> that's perfect. Uh, because it's so frustrating. Because here's the thing, here's the thing. If you know, investigations for what? You know, what should be illegal? Hedge fund, uh, 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 capital venture, venture capitalists being able to short stocks and ruin. I mean, this is really the, the same mechanism that actually ruined the economy, the housing market 2007, 2008, 2009, right? The concept of shorting stocks and shorting entire industries and flipping that uh, the, the misery of a company or the misery of an, in, of an a, a industry for profit. I'm sorry, no one should be able to profit off the misery of an entire industry. So if there's going to be any investigations, investigate that. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, and we, we're not going to re litigate all of the negative effects of them doing this, but they, but they are significant. Um, and so maybe it's not a bad thing to have a little bit of a shock to those hedge funds to stop them from doing it or from doing it yeah. in such a willy nilly fashion yeah. um, and causing all of the human and economic suffering that, that results from that. But as I'm as I'm like going over the the argument that these groups are making, it's just like seeing TD Ameritrade said it placed restrictions on certain types of trading activity on the companies. Quote in the interest of mitigating risk for our companies and clients. <laughs> okay, but you stopped people from trading this, so the stock price is plummeting. That's a risk to your clients. So yes, you wanted to protect some clients, but not other clients, and it's pretty clear which ones. Robinhood. To give you an idea of what they're doing, I am reading that more than half of Robinhood investors own GameStop stock, probably pretty recently, but they own it. And then that's just Rob, that's just GME, not the other ones as well. So half of their user base might lose a ton of money, but they still think it's in their own personal best interest. Whoever the board of Robinhood is, they think it is more important that some hedge fund benefits than the majority of our entire user base. <laughs> and I can't say what behind the scenes was happening in terms of communication or possible payoffs. And I'm not even saying direct payoffs, checks being cashed. But the I don't think that the idea that the Robin Hood board might have ownership shares in some of these hedge funds is a crazy thing to speculate. Oh yeah. And so <laughs> there's gonna yeah, need to be some massive investigations into this because that would there's no way that them shutting down trading on their platform to protect their own financial interests isn't some kind of violation of something. Right, right. They are willing to, but that shows you. Let's be sure. Like, there's also the very likelihood that these venture capitalists have investments in Robinhood, and so they yeah. would be doing the favor of their shareholders by screwing over the consumer, right? Because in this case, the investors think that they're investors, but you're actually the consumer of this app, this Robinhood app. And so the real investors in Robinhood are the people who own stocks in it. And so if they have a connection there, just Pure speculation, but if there's a connection there, then that's probably how they could get away with it. I think people just need to realize that you know when you are actually the investor versus the consumer, and all of the people who use Robinhood to make this move, you know, you, your money is at risk. But Robinhood doesn't see you as an investor; they see you as a product. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And by the way, uh, we haven't made any sort of financial advice in this, but just in case, it's always yeah. going to remind people. Oh, I said I wasn't an expert, but I'm not a financial advisor, obviously. Norris. Nor am um, I. <laughs> so exactly, so bear that in mind. I've already pretty much talked about my own personal um, involvement in all of this back and forth. It's not much, I'll tell you that. <laughs> but with the, the new uh, changes that have been made on Robin Hood and Charles Schwab and TD Ameritrade and a bunch of others, uh, there are those now calling for some sort of investigation to see what was done, what kind of you know information we don't have access to. Money possibly changing hands. Uh, I had a, there was a great tweet from Rashida Talib saying, "This is beyond absurd. Uh, the Dems need to have a hearing on Robin Hood's market manipulation. They're blocking the ability to trade to protect Wall Street hedge funds, stealing millions of dollars from their users to protect people who've used the stock market as a casino for decades, which is a hundred percent what they're doing." Uh, ben Shapiro like is all whiny that people are talking about these being casinos, but that's what they are. They're, these these hedge funds are literally betting. That's what they're doing. Yeah. And Representative Alexandria Costa Cortez added on saying this is unacceptable. We now need to know more about Robinhood app's decision to block retail investors from purchasing stock while hedge funds are freely able to trade the stock as they see fit. As a member of the Financial Services Committee, I'd support a hearing if necessary. And I saw that Ro Khanna 
uh, agreed to that. So I don't know about you, Ben. I personally would love to see Katie Porter with a whiteboard talking to the leadership of Robin Hood and getting right. to the bottom of this. Right, I think this speaks really, it's really important to take in consideration the importance of this moment because it speaks to the political nature of software, the political nature of these apps. These are not just benign um, or passive things that are on your phone. These are political um, ideologies, philosophies, capitalism. These they, they are deeply rooted. So the software that we download, uh, we really have to take in consideration the political implications. So I, I'm looking forward to the investigations. Exactly, exactly. And I expect that there's probably going to be a, there's there's a good number of representatives who actually will have the right position on this. It's mm-hmm. also like people have gotten worked up about it. So there's going to be opportunists who are going to pretend that they give a damn about this. Right. And um, one of those opportunists has already popped up. So uh, that AOC uh, tweet calling for an investigation, Ted Cruz uh, retweeted it with fully agree pointing down to it. To which AOC responded, I am happy to work with Republicans on this issue where there's common ground. But you almost had me murdered three weeks ago, so you can sit this one out. Happy to work with almost any other GOP that aren't trying to get me killed. In the meantime, if you want to help, you can resign. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) I feel like. (laughs) <laughs> I feel like that shot from The Shining. Oh my! Um, yes, more. He, he, he wasn't ready. <laughs> he wasn't ready. No, no, because he ain't good at this. He's not, and and he needs to understand. Fools that jump off get smacked down. I'm sorry, that that, that was the Pompano <laughs> Beach coming out of me. Sorry about that. But no, seriously, AOC is not one to play with, right? And the reality of it is, is like even if they are on the right side of this Robin Hood app issue, which I doubt they will be, I think it's going to be a fascinating opportunity for any of the libertarian esque side of the gamer community to see very transparently just how much Republicans would be opposed to them in this type of example of pulling out government regulations. But I digress. The point is, don't play with AOC. You're not ready to take exactly. it. <laughs> exactly. And the, the the right loves to pretend that they're in favor of regulation of Wall Street. Like even Trump during the 2016 campaign, he was like, I'm gonna get rid of their like tax loopholes and I'm gonna crack down on them. He would always use this particular type of investor thing as proof <laughs> that he's okay taxing the rich. Like right. that was the only part of it that had to do with the rich, but he would always point to that. By the way, they didn't do it. It was all a lie. The populist right doesn't actually exist. It's a scam. You need to be able right. to see past it. But he was at least savvy enough to know he needed to pretend. Right. Ted Cruz is trying to do the same thing. He just ain't as good at it. It's just not, it's not as good. And they also have to pretend as if they they believe in the free market, right? Republicans constantly mm-hmm. um, regurgitate that free market, free market. Well, the free market spoke. You just didn't like what it said, and now you you know a lot of conservatives are going to come on down on the side of um, of Robin Hood and the investors instead of the people who rallied and used their freedom, right? Free market says let the markets answer it. Conservatives don't believe in that. Yeah. Yeah, and by the way, um, you know this is obviously getting very ahead of whether there are even going to be hearings. But if there are hearings, here's the thing: if Robin Hood did break the law, which it really seems like either they did or the law needs to be changed, <laughs> then whatever money was lost by their investors, they need to provide to them. Exactly. We bail out Wall Street when Wall Street gets screwed over by the natural conclusion of the reckless behavior. These exactly. people. They weren't being reckless. Right. They were trading and it was working. They were pursuing a successful financial strategy. <laughs> and these few financial elites kneecapped them. And some regular people are gonna lose everything. So either mm. they need to bail them out or maybe the government needs to actually bail out regular people. John, just one last thing. This speaks to this is literally the case of the powerful having to break up collective action, right? What they do not want in any scenario, whether it be on Wall Street, right, in the markets, whether it be consumption and just purchasing, whatever, you know, none of these major organizations, none of these box stores, none of these, you know, corporations can afford to let the people get organized because if we do, we could break their institutions overnight. Yeah. Yeah, demonstrated by Reddit. We need to talk about a relatively new show called Un the Republic or UNFTR. As a Young Turks fan, you already know that the government, the media, and corporations are constantly peddling lies that serve the interests of the rich and powerful. But now there's a podcast dedicated to unraveling those lies, debunking the conventional wisdom. In each episode of Un the Republic or UNFTR, 
The host delves into a different historical episode or topic that's generally misunderstood or purposely obfuscated by the so-called powers that be, featuring in-depth research, razor-sharp commentary, and just the right amount of vulgarity The UNFTR podcast takes a sledgehammer to what you thought you knew about some of the nation's most sacred historical cows. But don't just take my word for it. The New York Times described UNFTR as consistently compelling and educational, aiming to challenge conventional wisdom and upend the historical narratives that were taught in school. For as the great philosopher Yoda once put it, you must unlearn what you have learned. And that's true whether you're in Jedi training or you're uprooting and exposing all the propaganda and disinformation you've been fed over the course of your lifetime. So search for UNFDR in your podcast app today and get ready to get informed, angered, and entertained all at the same time. New representative Marjorie Taylor Greene has been facing calls for her expulsion. Uh, This has been going on for about a week, but they're getting louder because she's crazier than we thought she was a week ago. Now, last week, we were infuriated by the fact that she had uh, agreed with comments online calling the 2018 shooting in Parkland a false flag operation, Mm. which means that it was all faked. You know, the stuff Alex Jones is in legal trouble for. Yeah, no, your congressperson has a chance of believing that. Um, She also liked other comments calling David Hogg a survivor of mass murder, hashtag little Hitler, and spread a conspiracy that he was a bought and paid little pawn and actor. So we're gonna show you the video, which you're probably thinking of already. But I want you to also take a look at this. This is a meme that she posted of David Hogg. I gave up mine, you give up yours. Definitely not a gun show, she says. This is one month after he survived an attempt at his own murder that took the lives of many of his friends. She was tweeting about how that high schooler's arms aren't impressive enough for her. (laughs) That's what this congresswoman, now congresswoman, was posting on Facebook there. That she wasn't turned on enough by this kid's biceps. Anyway, she didn't just post comments, she also stalked him in real time. So here is a video in DC of her following David Hogg around. Yeah. David, why are you supporting the red flag laws? If there had been, if Scott Peterson, the resource officer at Parkland had done his job, then Nicholas Cruz wouldn't have killed anybody in your high school or at least protected them. Why are you supporting red flag gun laws that attack our second amendment rights? And why are you using kids to get to as a barrier? Do you not know how to defend your stance? Look, I'm an American citizen, I'm a gun owner. I have a concealed carry permit. I carry a gun with for protection for myself and you are using your lobby and the money behind it and the kids to try to take away my second amendment rights. You don't have anything to say for yourself? You can't defend your stance? How did you get over 30 appointments with senators? How'd you do that? How did you get major press coverage on this issue? And how did you get kids? Why do you use kids? Why kids? You know, if school if school zones were protected by with security guards with guns, there would be no mass shootings at school. Do you know that? The best way to stop a bad guy with a gun is with a good guy with a gun. But yet you're attacking our Second Amendment. And you have nothing to say. No words. So I'm walking. He's got nothing to say. Sad. Yeah, elsewhere in the video, she accuses him of taking Soros money and big liberal money. Um, and the stuff about, like, do you, not, do you not know that? That the good guy with a gun stops a bad guy with a gun? And we, she just, all she is, is a collection of memes and conspiracy <laughs> theories, things that she read online that she instantly stuffed into her empty brain. That's all it is. And uh, we're going to have more, but Ben, I wanted to give you a chance. Um, what do you think about that now, Congresswoman? Um, I'm curious how much that bag cost. 
I don't think that bag is particularly cheap. And the only reason I bring that up is because, you know, she likes to position herself as a victim here, right? And the only thing that she can use to position herself as a victim is the Second Amendment. This imagined fight against the Second Amendment that, you know, generally speaking, most Americans aren't trying to get rid of the Second Amendment. That's just a scare tactic. Most people just want to make sure that we stop killing our children in school. And so she's pitting her imagined grief. Grievance, right? When she has everything that she wants, and I don't know bags and purses, but I just got a feeling that's not a cheap one. She's got it so good that all she has time to do is go harass a survivor of a mass shooting. Yep. To fly cross country to harass someone who is processing the PTSD of watching their friends gun down. Now, before we go to his response, which does exist, I wanted to help people understand one part of what she said there because it's a little bit confusing. What you need to understand is that she is both dumb and crazy. And so sometimes what she says is explained by being dumb, sometimes by crazy. So what she kept saying there was, why do you use kids? Why do you use kids? And and a rational person might hear that and think, wait, what are you talking about? Why does he use kids? He's a kid, kids were murdered. That's why they use kids. And it doesn't make sense. Now, it might seem like maybe she's just dumb enough to make that point, but no, in this case, it's not dumb. It's actually stupid. The reason, or it's actually crazy. The reason she's saying that is because you need to understand she doesn't think that shooting happened at all. Mm. She doesn't think he was shot at. She doesn't think that kids were killed at that shooting or at other big shootings. She thinks he is just a bought and paid for person of this lobby that uses kids by making up shootings. That's what she's talking about there. Just like in her Facebook activity, she thinks that he's lying. She thinks Mm. that Fred Guttenberg, who's appeared on the show multiple times, is lying about his daughter being murdered. And so her being dumb is bad. In this case, I think her being crazy is worse because Mm. I've seen no evidence that she doesn't still believe that. John, these these people exist in a parallel universe, except they're right here with us, right? Up is down, down is up. Truth is 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 fiction. Fiction is truth to them. They have there's no limit to which they're willing to lie to themselves in order to protect themselves from ever having to consider a thought that that challenges their ego, that challenges their way of thinking, their philosophies, and so they're willing to tell us that the sky is green and the grass is blue, so that yeah. they can maintain that cognitive dis, dissonance. Yeah, yeah. Or you know some of them aren't true believers. They tell they tell their followers that so they can maintain their you know their funding, their make some money, their yeah, audience, there's, whatever. There's that <laughs> exactly. Now um, David Hogg has responded to this video of Marjorie Taylor Greene uh, going around once again, and here is what he had to say about it. She was heckling you. I mean, obviously you had survived the Parkland school shooting, so she's bringing all of this up. She also said during that that she said, "I have a concealed carry permit. I carry a gun." She said, for protection. Did you, how did you interpret that? Did you hear that as a threat when she was chasing you saying that? Oh, absolutely. But you know, what I always say to myself, Allison, is that if it, you know, if they shoot me, they prove my point. And the reality is they can't kill a movement because the reality with that as well, and you know, it's funny when they say that we're paid off and stuff. And I can tell you that there's no amount of money that you could ever pay any of us to do this work because that's not why we do it. None of us want to be doing this, but we have to because sadly, corrupt elected officials like Marjorie Taylor Greene are in Congress and would rather choose to protect guns than children. And back when she was an activist, this is what she was doing. And now she can actually vote on bills. She can try to stop gun control legislation and things like that. And she now has that power. Yeah. Yeah, and 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 I can you know anytime you do something um, and you do it for the right reasons, there's always somebody there to accuse you of taking some money, right? I've gotten accused of taking Soros money since day one. I mean, there are plenty of days I could have used some. So George Soros, mm-hmm. you know, give me a holler or whatever. But the fact remains is that the, they're doing this work because they went through something that changed their life forever, and they're going to have a bond with the people who survived that Parkland shooting right there on the other side of Coconut Creek. Florida. It's like it, it is. It is a. This is a reality. It's a real place. These were real people, real children, and they're doing this because they can't let this happen to anyone else. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. And they've, you know, like Marjorie Taylor Greene's attacks against him are some of the individually worse against him and against others because he's not the only person that she's 
um, you know, smearing when she says that the whole thing's made up. Um, there are any number of, of other kids from that shooting and for others that have tried to protect the lives of other kids and they do it because they have to because we don't have enough elected representatives to actually make it happen. Like we focus on her here because what she's saying is abhorrent. But understand that the government hasn't done anything about guns since that shooting or since you know Sandy Hook or against Pulse or against Thousand Trees, against Ugh. any of these shootings. And it didn't just do it because Marjorie Taylor Greene is bad. For every Marjorie Taylor Greene, there's 50 or 100 Republicans that agree on the goals with her. They just don't make as clear what they believe about Satanists eating children and stuff like that. But they will vote the exact same way as a Marjorie Taylor Greene, and they have. The reason that that David Hogg has to keep doing this, that you know Emma Gonzalez, that a number of others have to keep doing this, is because nothing was done after any of those shootings. Right. And so she's the worst, and we're focusing on her, I think, justifiably. But there are a lot of other Republicans that are just as bad on the actual substance. Yeah, yeah. No, that, I think that's really important and something that's completely not important. But I just have to say before you end the segment, um, David Hogg is growing up. He's got his whole beard situation does, going yeah. on. <laughs> Looking like, what, what's the actor that played Chris, Christian Bale? Looking like Christian Bale on there. So, uh, <laughs> hey man, you guys be encouraged, uh, 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 mm -hmm. David. Uh, don't let these people get you down. You guys are doing an amazing work. Yeah. Now, now watch, Marjorie Taylor Greene is gonna be like, look, even the lib media admits he's an actor. <laughs> anyway, um, we're not done with Marjorie Taylor Greene though, unfortunately. This is building to something and we'll get oh. there. But we got one more little bit to go through. Marjorie Taylor Greene isn't just a person who believes that every shooting is a false flag and that babies are being eaten for their hormones. She also believes some insane things about other elected representatives. And I know what you're thinking. John, you're talking about all those posts that she agreed with that she wants to get Nancy Pelosi shot and she wants Barack Obama to be hung. No, I'm talking about a different issue. Here she is when she went to the Capitol to try to protest the swearing in of then new representatives Rashida Tlaib and Ilhan Omar. They signed it, they swore in on the Korean. Oh, we have the Bible. We're gonna talk about swearing in on the, uh, how to swear in on the Bible mm -hmm. with them mm -hmm. and let them know what our law says, yes. that you can't swear in on the Korean. So we're gonna, we're gonna explain that. You know, we're gonna explain about how you can't swear in on the Korean and we're yeah. gonna have the Bible and ask them if they would swear in on the Bible, mm -hmm. that we really need we have them. the oath. Yeah, we have the oath, yep. So I think no, that's important. Now they can say it. The sad thing is, now you're, they can say it. You're infringing, infringing on our religion. Which they you should you're, not You're infringing on our religion yes. by saying that we can't swear in on the Quran. But when they swore in, it wasn't a law yet, right? So at the time yeah, they swore in. I don't know. I think at the time they swore in, that wasn't passed. Yeah. Because it wouldn't have been passed in a Republican control. Right. Yeah, so it was passed after they swore in. So they're not really official, I don't think. So let's go ask them to swear in in the Bible. Because like you is said, it, well, I'm... It has to be the Holy Bible? I, yeah, it has to be the Bible. It well, the bottom, be, line is is yeah, the bottom line is Sharia yeah. law is not compatible with, with America. Yep. That's the bottom line. That's the bottom line. How can you say you represent women, but you support Sharia law? You're gonna be shocked to find out that everything she was saying there was wrong. I mean, look, I get it if you're distracted by the fact that everything she was saying was awful. It was also awful, but don't get it twisted, it's also wrong as we'll go into. Ben, what do you think? She thinks the Constitution wasn't passed by the time people swore in on the Quran or whatever she's complaining about here. Folks. She's not by herself. That's all I want to say. She's it, mm -hmm. there. There are a lot of people, and and you know, I'm listening to her accent, and I'm like, it doesn't help that her accent, um, it, you know, she has a southern accent like me, a little bit deeper. There are a lot of brilliant, um, even brilliant conservatives from the South. Some of them are my friends, but she is not one of them. She's not. <laughs> she is not. And so, look, um, she's there, not because of some. Good faith, if entirely misplaced concern about sticking to the letter of the law. She's there because she hates Muslims and she doesn't think that you should be able to be elected as a Muslim. That's at the end of the day um, why she is there. And she's wrong. Mm. What she was insinuating in that video was that there was some law that required all members of Congress to be sworn in on the Bible. At the time of Mrs. Omar and Mrs. Tlaib's ceremonies, she claimed there was no law allowing them to use a Quran over the Bible. Now, 
This is, of all of the insane Marjorie Taylor Greene things we've said, probably the most broad brush one because there's tons of Republicans that seem to believe this. It's been repeated in recent years by other fringe members of the Republican Party about the swearing in. So let's be very clear. There is and never has been a law in US history that requires an elected official of the country to take the oath of office with a Bible or any other religious text. If you took the time to read the Constitution, which she definitely hasn't, it is written text after all. The United States Constitution states no religious test shall ever be required as a qualification to any office or public trust under the United States. Why does the Constitution specifically say this? Because the framers of the Constitution valued the separation of church versus state, but that's inconvenient. And Marjorie Taylor Greene didn't get this far accepting and processing inconvenient, incompatible mm. facts. Mm. And so, by the way, four presidents and several members of Congress have been sworn in without the use of a Bible. So don't mix up the fact that lots of people that have been elected in the past want you to believe that there's no wall. So they love getting the Bible involved in it. That doesn't mean that it's required. The Constitution specifically says no test. Everything that she said was 100% inaccurate. Yeah, uh, so she and I come from two totally different interpretations of the Bible. I mean, I if if I were president, I probably would swear myself in on the on the Bible, right? Uh, but she looks to use the Bible as a bludgeoning tool, to, as a tool of domination, dominion theology. Her intention is to dominate the global society with her very particular and very specific version of Christianity, which is a direct lineage of the Christianity that used to lynch black people on Saturday night and then go to church on Sunday morning. So we don't we don't worship the same guy at all. So just exactly. put that on the record. <laughs> and for the record, I would either swear myself in on a printed copy of the Green New Deal or possibly one of the Harry Potter books because either one of those would cause Laura Ingram's oh. skull to explode on live television. I would also swear in on a TARDIS, the the blue TARDIS. <laughs> like it's 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 either the the Bible or the TARDIS, and and that's yeah. what we use. Man, I've got like this, um, you know, the, the cartoon Archer. I've got an art book from it. I really like that art. So anyway, that, no, there's that no will test. work too. That will work too. Exactly. <laughs> okay, so where are we going with this? There is now an effort to expel Marjorie Taylor Greene from office, hopefully before she gets someone killed. Representative Jimmy Gomez, um, he tweeted, I don't need to explain why Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene is a clear and present danger to Congress and our democracy. She did it herself and she must go. I'm introducing a resolution to expel her from Congress immediately. And uh, we have a little bit of video of him being interviewed about this. Here is Representative Gomez. What about your Republican colleagues? Congressman Adam Kinzinger, for example, tweeted that Green, quote, is not a Republican. Have you spoken with anybody across the aisle? Do you think you will get any Republican support for this? I hope we get Republican support. We are reaching out actively to the Republican offices, asking them to co-sponsor this resolution. But they're gonna have a chance to either decide, are they on the side of facts, reason, Rational political discourse, or then on the side of conspiracy theories, QAnon supporters, people that believe that political violence is a legitimate act in order to get your way in American politics. The Republican leader, Kevin McCarthy, um, plans to have a conversation with Green, according to Axios. Is it not enough for you that Republicans hold their own accountable? Uh, I don't think he's going to hold her uh, accountable. Yeah, I, 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 Ben, you, you, I'm sure that you saw that he's going to have a talk with her. What do you expect to come of that? He's going to say, tone it down. We just got to go a little bit more clandestine over the next four years because we don't have the big kahuna Donald Trump to cover us. We can't be as wild as we used to be, Marjorie. So, you know, just tuck in your racism and your xenophobia, your Islamophobia, your homophobia. Tuck it in just enough to fall within the acceptable parameters of the Republican Party. Yeah. Yeah. I, like he he need, he understands, I'm sure, where the party is going. There's a chance she'll be minority leader in the, in the, in the House at some point. Um, and the question, I I get it, I get that you have to ask a question like that. But is it not enough that they you know they manage their own side? Well, why are you asking me pure hypotheticals? Because you know as well as I do that they're not going to. There's not going to be anything done from their side. And if there was something done. And we knew what it was, then we can discuss. But it's not going to happen, and we don't even know what the hypothetical is, so there's no point in it. No, she. If you were watching this, 
and you are a conservative or whatever, you're not a Democrat. I want you to honestly answer the question. If we found out that Rashida Tlaib had been liking comments about putting a bullet in Mitch McConnell's head, would they be just like, "Oh no, that's totally fine. Difference of opinion. You can totally mm. stay there." Does anyone actually believe that? No. Does no. anyone actually believe that? And when no. she's stalking people through the streets of DC, kids who are processing their PTSD from mass shootings and saying that she has a gun. And when she's talking about Hillary Clinton consuming children for hormones and all like I I can't even remember all of the insane things that go beyond the line for what our expectations should be for like the person who scoops our ice cream, let alone Congress people. <laughs> I'm, I'm, for, I'm blanking her name, Katie Hill. She resigned because she had been in an affair, like a personal affair that had nothing to do with her job. She has supported the murder of politicians and they're, they're gonna talk to her. They're gonna seriously talk to her. No, she needs to get out of there. She needs to get, for so many different reasons, she needs to get out of there. She is a direct, she has a direct lineage with the people who marched up the steps on January 6th, I forget the exact date, but right before the inauguration. She has a direct connection to them. She's from the same train of thought, the same type of thinking, the type of people who will destroy this democracy because they have to maintain some QAnon level delusion mm -hmm. in order to not to come to terms with the fact that they are part and parcel complicit with the problems in this country. 100%. If she had not gotten elected, she would have been storming the Capitol. Exactly. She was already following 100%. kids around in the Capitol years before. She 100% would have been. Anyway, I want to go to one last thing to, to perhaps explain why you should not have high expectations from Kevin McCarthy. <laughs> Here is Representative Alexandria Ocasio Cortez on him. I actually sense a profound difference between the Republican caucus of last term, the 115th Congress, and the Republican caucus that of this term, that we are now, what, a few weeks into at this point. Um, and that difference was that it really felt that last term, the Republican caucus was one of extreme fealty to Donald Trump. Um, there were some that were true believers, um, others that simply remained quiet out of cowardice mm -hmm. um, and out of fear of the president's retribution. Um, but this term, there are legitimate white supremacist sympathizers that sit at the heart and at the core of the Republican caucus in the House of Representatives. And when you see someone like the, like the, the House Minority Leader, Kevin McCarthy of the Republican Party uh, respond, to white supremacist vitriol coming from his own members, not with censure like they did with um, Representative Steve King of Iowa, um, not with you know being stripped of committees, not with any consequence. You have to wonder where who actually has that power, and it increasingly seems, unfortunately, that. In the House Republican Caucus, Kevin McCarthy answers to these QAnon members of Congress, not the other way around. Wow, that's pretty strong. Wow, don't Let's mess see. with, don't mess with AOC because that's the core of the issue. The issue is is that they create a a monster and they played Republicans. They have been playing with the monster for the last forty years, and now it's coming back to eat them. And and she's right, Kevin McCarthy isn't in charge, <laughs> not at all. And didn't Kevin McCarthy just go down to meet with Trump? Was that him? I don't want to give people misinformation, but Sophie's shaking her head. Um, yeah, does everyone remember what, what Trump had to say about QAnon during the election? They're just good people. They're just good, good people. people. They love America. They love right. Trump, I hear. They're yeah. worried about the kids. The kids. So, no, he, he, knows, he knows exactly what QAnon is because he spends every minute of his life that isn't spent looking at Fox and Friends is looking yeah. at his phone, which is on right wing BS websites. Right. He knows what it is. He's okay with it. Kevin McCarthy is deferential to him. That is the Trump thing. Well, what is what is the crossover between QAnon and MAGA? Oh, like you think there's a lot of QAnon people who are like, well, I don't want to make America great again. Anyway, <laughs> the Venn yeah, diagram. Circle, so the the Venn yeah. diagram is spectacular on that one. Exactly. So we'll see, Kevin McCarthy. Maybe you don't. Maybe you aren't so scared of the future of your party and your own position of leadership that you're terrified that Lauren Boebert or Marjorie Taylor Greene or Madison Cawthorn are going to replace you in the next couple of years. 
but you have to demonstrate it. So we're gonna see what you do. And I got an idea of what it's gonna be, and it ain't gonna be much. Hey, uh, so there was this meme, and you're probably not familiar with it. Like you have to be like really cool and online to know what it is. But it had to do with a picture of Bernie that you can see here. You're seeing it now for the first time. Uh, but a lot of people actually went pretty crazy from this, and so it became this big thing, and it was everywhere, including on Bernie Sanders' campaign store, where he was selling this Chairman Sanders design to raise money for charity and raise money. They did. They raised $1.8 million in five days for different charitable organizations selling those shirts. And Bernie Sanders put out a statement in response to that amazing haul of money saying, Jane and I were amazed by all the creativity shown by so many people over the last week. And we're glad we can use my internet fame to help Vermonters in need. But even this amount of money, is this is where it gets so Bernie. But even this amount of money is no substitute for action by Congress. And I will be doing everything I can in Washington to make sure working people in Vermont and across the country get the relief they need in the middle of the worst crisis we faced since the Great Depression. <laughs> Which is great because like obviously the $1.8 million doesn't mean that like, oh, 2020 didn't happen, but he can do both. He right. can do both. Right. You know, I <laughs> shout out to my president, <laughs> Bernie Sanders. Like, don't get me wrong. <laughs> Thank you, Joe Biden, for getting rid of Donald Trump. But as for me and my house, in terms of how we want to help the people, I want to always keep that spirit that Bernie has. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I know that it, like it's so early into Biden's term that if you're one of the leftists that like, man, I you know I kind of still I wish it was Bernie. A lot of people would be like, shut up, why are you, why are you yeah. being negative? It's good Leave time. us alone. Let us let us enjoy. Let us have something, okay? You guys pulled a fast one on us on Super Tuesday. Let us have this moment, all right? Exactly. <laughs> and by the way, like I supported Biden, and how much credit have I been giving him the last <laughs> week? I'm same side, same side. Yeah, I'm with you. Yeah. I'm not with the Boogaloo Boys. But that said. Bernie was my guy, and I kind of think it would still be great if he was president, but it's not going to happen. Okay, right, so right. you get the last laugh; he's never yeah. going to be president. Yeah, but anyway, but but no one, no one's going to ever be cooler than Bernie Sanders. No, no chairman of the budget committee is ever going to be as cool as yes. Bernie Sanders. There you go. Exactly, exactly, and I can't wait to see what he does in that. Uh, but really fast to let you know, uh, the groups that uh, received money as a result of this include the area agencies on aging to fund Meals on Wheels throughout Vermont, Vermont Community Action Agencies, Feeding Chittenden, uh, Chill Foundation, which sounds great, Senior Centers in Vermont, and by state primary care for dental care improvements in the state. And by the way, I, I actually was surprised by this. A lot of other people have gotten involved in the trying to raise money. Um, uh, the, the woman who made the mittens made some extra mittens to be auctioned off. Um, the same coat that he's wearing, the company that makes it donated like 50 of the coats or whatever. Even Getty, Getty Images donated the proceeds from that photo to Meals on Wheels of America, oh, wow, which I would that, not have expected. So that's pretty cool. That's amazing, that's amazing. Yeah. Great work, Bernie, you have done good. <laughs> um, yeah. Anyway, now that's the good news. Let's move on to a little bit more negative news. There are a lot of state governments that don't do the right thing, but some states allow people to weigh in. And in the past few years, there have been a number of great ballot initiatives that have accomplished what state governments won't. But unfortunately, you also have state governments that really don't give a damn what happens with these ballot initiatives, so they try to defang them. And we have an example of that here. Less than three months after voters approved a constitutional amendment to raise Florida's minimum wage to $15 an hour, a Senate Republican has filed a proposal that could lead to some workers making less than that. So take a look at this, really take a look at this. The amendment approved in the November election will increase the minimum wage to $10 an hour on September 30th and annual increases will bring it to 15 an hour on September 30th, 2026. But Senate Judiciary Chairman Jeff Brandis, Republican filed a proposal Wednesday that, if approved, would modify that amendment to allow the legislature to provide a reduced minimum wage for workers under the age of 21, those convicted of felonies, state prisoners, and for other hard to hire employees. So we've got a little bit more on like theoretically him trying to defend this. But he is just saying like, if you're one of these groups, we want you to be standing next to other workers doing the exact same job. But because we don't like your group, we want you to make significantly less money. Mm. That's amazing, Ben. Yeah, it's a, it's and they're so transparent with it. The other thing is the timeline, right? Twenty twenty six. 
I mean, the, the minimum wage right now, if it kept up with workers efficiency should be somewhere around $22, right? So by 2026, that efficiency should probably be $30 an hour. And, and, I, and we got to get out of this, um, this type of incrementalism that seeks to pacify and assuage the anguish of the people with solutions that are going to be insufficient in the future because they're insufficient now. Yeah, I mean, that's so yes, uh, that's a problem. And that's a problem with with this ballot initiative, but also with what's being discussed in Washington. It's, you know, it's obviously a much better situation than keeping it 725, which Trump would have been yeah. perfectly happy with eliminating yeah. it altogether. Lots of Republicans would. Um, but all of your criticisms are 100% valid. But like, like specifically saying, like those convicted of felonies, right, who already have a hard time getting a job. Now, if yeah. you're actually able to get one, Screw you, we want you to make as little money as possible. Right. Now, he didn't immediately respond to a request from the appeal where there's great reporting on this and you can read all the details there at the appeal. But he spent the day on Twitter uh, claiming that lowering the minimum wage for teens or the formerly incarcerated will somehow help them. He cited multiple right or libertarian leaning think tanks which alleged that minimum wage hikes would lead to a spike in unemployment for those groups. A significant amount of research contradicts those claims as we've gone over a million times. Um, one representative from Florida uh, pointed out that higher wages will keep people out of prison, which they claim is their goal to not have recidivism and all of that. He responded to that saying, once they get a job, <sighs> but but you're not doing anything that changes the chance of them getting a job. You're just trying to hurt them if they do get a job. So right, right. I don't even understand that response. But she responds to that saying, and the jobs they find right now pay poverty wages, which often put them back into prison. Increasing the wage will keep them out of prison. If your point is that we don't have enough jobs for the incarcerated, let's create them, not punish them. And also, hard to expect the formerly incarcerated to pay their fines, fees without a good paying job. Just saying, which actually ties very well into another topic, which we're gonna get to in just a second. But that seems like a great point. If you want people to not get in prison in the first place, let alone go back to it. Yeah. Pay them a good wage. Yeah. And John, John, back to your, your your first point too, right? That can't be overstated. You know, the fact that they're trying to vilify in, in this way, they're trying to use um, someone's past to vilify their future, right? And and the, the willingness to do that really, you know, as as the people, you know, we the people, us, you know, all of us, if we allow them to do this with returned citizens, people who have paid their dues and their debts for what they did, if we allow them to do that for them, then it's obviously a backdoor way to keep minimum wage reduced for as many people as possible. So we can't allow them to use our fear of return citizens and to vilify them because it's going to end up hurting us in return. Exactly, and uh, this isn't the first time that Florida has tried to either totally eliminate or defang a ballot initiative. Yeah. It's not even the first time they've done it with regards to return citizens. So yeah. the Florida, Florida legislature has long treated grassroots ballot initiatives with open content, contempt. In 2017, after more than 70% of state voters elected to legalize medical marijuana, state lawmakers responded by temporarily making it illegal to smoke medicinal weed. In 2018, when a super majority of Floridians voted to return voting rights to at least 1.4 million formerly incarcerated people, the GOP dominated legislature passed a glorified poll tax that made sure that 800,000 of those people remained ineligible to vote. So they basically said, um, you still can't vote. Until you pay off all these fines and we're gonna make it virtually impossible, not only for you to do this. And by the way, this is one way to help make it impossible for you to pay off those fines by making sure you earn as little as possible. But in many cases, it was almost impossible to even find out what your fees were. They'd created a system that was impossible to navigate. Even if you 100% just wanted to pay off your debt to society monetarily in addition to the incarceration, which you already paid, they made it impossible because the goal is not to stimulate more civic responsibility. It's to stop these people from voting because they right. believe that these people are gonna vote for Democrats. Absolutely, absolutely, because they are, they're gonna vote. And in fact, they're gonna vote to the left of Democrats. They're gonna vote to change the system because if anyone understands exactly how brutal this system is, the people who are, 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 are being housed for profit by these corporations that make money off of private prisons. But shout out to Joe Biden for canceling those contracts. And also shout out to Desmond Mead, he's the brother who worked on that initiative in Florida that helped return citizens get their voting rights in. And I have to actually, didn't Michael Bloomberg, didn't he kind of fly in to try to help pay off of some of the, some of those debts if Supposedly. I remember correctly? Supposedly yeah. he did actually, yeah, I, don't, uh, I don't remember a final amount. 
Look at you giving credit to him. <laughs> didn't expect to see that. I didn't either, but if he actually does it, hey, you know, broken clock, exactly. right? <laughs> Exactly. And uh, by the way, uh, if you want, to, <laughs> I just checked because when you said Desmond Mead, it like it, it rung a bell. We actually interviewed Desmond Mead about that oh, effort, so that's, that's available amazing. if people are interested as well. Um, anyway, yeah, just the demonization. By the way, uh, shout out to Bernie Sanders, who relatively early on in the primary uh, last time around called for uh, people still serving their sentences to be able to vote because uh, newsflash, there's nothing in the Constitution that says that they shouldn't be able to. That's just a thing that we decided. And um, it works out that uh, politicians saying that those in prison are bad are always gonna have more people on their side than those who say, hey, but they're still humans. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, he got criticized a lot for that. And uh, now it turns out that people around the country think that you don't necessarily lose all of your consideration, your you know human worth and all of that when you go to prison. Mm, absolutely. Anyway, with that, why don't we roll through one more quick story before we close things out? I don't want to keep Ben for too long, but this is an important one. Elections have consequences, and from a long enough point of view, one of the biggest consequences is what happens with the federal judiciary. And so, with Donald Trump winning in 2016, we saw that he has now put one third of the Supreme Court on, so that's going to be fun for the rest of our lives. But this time, Biden won. And that is already going to have a significant impact because five federal judges with lifetime appointments have announced plans to retire or semi retire since last Wednesday, just the first week since Donald Trump left the White House, according to data provided by the Administrative Office of the US Courts. That's after eight judges had already announced their plans to step down once Biden was declared the winner of the 2020 presidential election. On Tuesday, two more US district judges announced their plans to take senior status. Which is like a sort of initiation into semi retirement that will inevitably lead to them being retired. And so one wrote, by the way, this is a US District Judge William Alsep wrote, Congratulations on becoming our new president. I feel it's time now for me to go senior. So <laughs> it seems like a bunch of these people were waiting for Trump to finally be gone. And so we're gonna have some more numbers for you, but Biden is already gonna have some vacancies that he can fill which is the beginning of a process of trying to undo some of the damage to the judiciary that Trump was able to do over the last four years. Mm -hmm. I'm just looking at the um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg uh, icon you have behind you <laughs> on your shelf because <laughs> that was that was a really tough time this summer when, when she passed away. And I mean, of course, there's the judiciary up and down, um, not just the Supreme Court. So uh, this is the time for anyone who can retire because we see what Republicans do with when they get within 75 yards of the of the field goal, right? They go for it. And so we can't afford to play that, uh, to risk that again, no. Yeah. Yeah, and so we're going to see that with um, you know district uh, and appellate judges. We'll we'll see about the Supreme Court. I don't know. I think the oldest current Supreme Court justice I think is 86 years old, which is certainly up there. Um, the one who served the longest is Clarence Thomas, but he's a mm -hmm. bit younger. If he were to retire, that would be significant. There, not, none of this is going to result in the Democrats uh, in having any sort of majority or anything like that, but it will at least be a start. Right. Now, um, let's talk a little bit about some of the numbers. Eight of the retiring judges were appointed by Bill Clinton, two by Barack Obama, but five were appointed by President George W. Bush. Um, which means that as of Wednesday, Biden has 46 district court vacancies and three appeals court vacancies uh, to fill, which is a good amount. But understand that it is not nearly as much as Trump had when he came in. Uh, the federal judiciary had 117 vacancies due to deaths, <coughs> retirements, and promotions. Shortly after Trump took office in 2017, which is a bit more than twice as much. And that, of course, is because Mitch McConnell had stopped Obama from getting yes. judges for what felt like years by the time the transition happened. Yeah. And that meant that in the end, Trump put more than 230 people into lifetime judgeships. That's far more than Obama at 175, who served for twice as long, Bush at 206, Clinton at 204. So we're talking about two eight year presidencies still couldn't match up to what Trump was able to get in four years because of the Senate. So that's just to remind you of how much work there is to be done to try to reverse some of that damage. Damage that you know is already cropping up with immigration executive orders, but is gonna touch on everything, including possibly the ACA, minimum wage, Medicare for all, the Green New Deal if it ever gets proposed, a lot of these things. There are all sorts of little like landmines out there in the form of Trump judges that would love to overthrow all of it if it yeah. happened.
Yeah, there's been some significant damage and thank you for pointing it all out. And that's why this is the damage report. <laughs> <laughs> it is, it is. Anyway, Ben, as always, it is a pleasure to have you on the show. Um, but I want to reassure people that though you're not going to be on the show tomorrow, your show goes on. Actually, multiple of your shows. So where can people yes. watch those? You all need to tune in every morning at 830 to the morning trap. It's me, but it's with all of my friends and we had a great time this morning. Go check out this morning's episode every morning at 830 Eastern on YouTube. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ben. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Take care. A lot of people are wondering what the future holds for Donald Trump. What is he going to do? How is he going to worm his way back into our head? Well, we don't have all the answers for you, but we do have someone who's going to join us now to talk a little bit about the future of the relationship between Donald Trump and the Republican Party and their leadership, at the very least. Joining us once again is the senior Washington correspondent for Business Insider, Dave Leventhal. As always, welcome back to the Damage Report. Hey, thanks for having me, John. Uh, glad to have you here. So uh, the Republican Party has been, from at least an outsider's point of view, unfailingly loyal to Donald Trump, up to and including uh, most of the members being okay with his attempt to overthrow the election. So I have to imagine that the relationship is strong, right? I mean, after all they've given to him for years now. And that's strong uh, to the point of Donald Trump wanting it to be strong. It's possible, John, that there could be a schism here. A, a divorce, and here's one big reason why. Donald Trump may get sick of the Republican Party. He may want to leave. He may want to form his own party, and reporting has it that he potentially is entertaining that idea. Now, whether it happens, whether that's ever gonna become a reality in a month or a year, or be it when it is, we don't know at this point. Donald Trump may not know at this point. Mm -hmm. But the fact of the matter is that Donald Trump, he came in and he took over the Republican Party. The Republican Party became the party of Trump. And now that Donald Trump isn't president anymore, well, he's uh, he's got some options, even though he uh, doesn't have the option that he, mm -hmm. he wants to engage in right now, which is another four years in the White House. Exactly, so you've had some great reporting um, in the recent past, including with uh, Tom LoBianco who's also been on the program about some of what we know about what's going on with the RNC and Donald Trump over the future of certain assets like voter data files and things like that. Why, why is that so important for the future of this relationship? Well, let, let's just say for the sake of argument, John, that there is a divorce between Donald Trump and the Republican Party. There is so much at stake here. We talk about divorces and it's like, oh, you know, who's gonna get the house and who's gonna get the car and the kids? Well, <laughs> with Donald Trump and the Republican Party, it's who's gonna get the massive, crazy amount of data on all the millions, tens of millions of supporters and backers and donors to Donald Trump and the Republican Party. This has been a shared asset. At, there is, we know, a contractual agreement between the two. That is not a matter of public record, at least at this point. But what we know and what we reported is that this is just an incredibly valuable uh, asset. Uh, and Donald Trump has, you know, kind of the uh, kind of the upper hand here in the sense that this was his presidential campaign. And if he is able to take that information, use that information, even rent or sell that information, it's a huge commodity. It's very valuable. And Donald Trump not only will be able to breathe incredible amounts of life into whatever that next act is for him, but also too, he can just make a heck of a lot of money off mm -hmm. of it as well. Okay, so I, I was a little bit confused because it seemed like in terms of having access to the data, it seems like it'd be in the best interest of both parties to continue to have it. But you're implying that he might in the future either sell it or loan it out like to future campaigns, possibly people running for Senator for the House, that sort of thing. Well, let's just look at Mitt Romney back in 2012, just as a quick example. He ran for president, he lost. And then he had all this information on all these supporters. He spent years renting that information out to data brokers, to Newsmax, to all these different places that were really interested in marketing or or getting access to that information so they could resell it to another third party. I mean, this is valuable information. So buyer beware, or at least you know, supporter beware, when you give your information to a political party, it's not just going to the campaign that you're supporting, okay? It might be going any of a dozen and one different places, including people who have a profit motivation as opposed to just a political motivation. One consideration here, but it's a important one for Donald Trump and of course, any political entity that's out there trying to do politics. 
And so we've you've implied that that is a valuable thing for the in, for the future of him to potentially make money off of. Why why is it so valuable? Why why is it so prized? These data files of voter information. Because these are people who give money. These are people who have a, a, a demonstrable track record of that kind of support. So if you're trying to sell a product, if you're trying to sell a candidate, if you're trying to sell an idea, you don't want to sell it to people who don't care, okay? You want to sell it to people who have a pretty good shot at opening up their wallet, getting their credit card out and saying, all right, cool, I'm, I'm gonna support that too. So that's where the value of that kind of information comes in. And it's not just information that you voluntarily give, it can be married with other sorts of information, voter file information, even information from consumer data brokers. I mean, it gets pretty sophisticated. Hmm. And it's been many, many years in the making to get to this point where effectively political parties, political candidates, Donald Trump, they have dossiers on their supporters in a way, in a very real way. And that's mm -hmm. where the marketability of that information comes into very, very stark relief. And so we know that obviously Donald Trump was able to accrue this information and his campaign over a long period of time. And even after the election, there was a lot of fundraising that was going on, a lot of communication with people who'd signed up to, to various lists of his. Um, we, we know that Donald Trump obviously isn't tweeting and he doesn't seem to be saying much recently. He's not going on the media. Do we have any indication that those sorts of direct appeals, fundraising, those sorts of things, are those still going on after the inauguration? So I expect that they're gonna come back. Now, Donald Trump is, is, is definitely gone into dormant mode here, okay? At least as it appears to the public eye. But there have been, John, several things that we've identified that have been happening over even just the past several days. Donald Trump, for example, has opened a post presidency office, which he has staffed with staffers. And that is going to be a vehicle for him to be Donald Trump in his post presidency era. He also has a political action committee, it's called Save America, that he started up in November and can raise thousands of dollars from individuals and people and act very much like a campaign after the campaign, if you will. Mm -hmm. He also still has his presidential campaign, which is open and active. He could use it if he decides to run for reelection. So that's something else that he's got going on too. And then as we mentioned before, the specter of Donald Trump breaking off and starting his own political party. That remains and also to what Donald Trump might do on the media end. There's been talk for months now about Donald Trump potentially starting his own TV network, his own media company. Why not? I mean, Donald Trump is a part and parcel, media is part and parcel of Donald Trump. So, you know, it's an option that he definitely has mm -hmm. at his offing as well. Yeah, a lot of interesting possibilities. There's, you know, political implications to that office that he set up, let alone starting his own party. He could, as you point out, raise quite a bit of money. He also, based on your most recent reporting as of this morning, there, there's this complaint that's been filed that I believe we talked about some of this earlier about ways that spending was done that we don't necessarily understand that were fairly opaque. Um, it seems like if he's done that in the past, in the future, in theory, especially when he's not president anymore, he might be even more freed up to do fundraising and spending in ways that are not necessarily in line with what people might think when they donate. But um, could you tell us a little bit about your most recent reporting on this area, this complaint that was filed? Yeah, we were just reported that Donald Trump, a new complaint has been filed by the Campaign Legal Center, a nonprofit good government organization that was based in part on our reporting that indicated that there is a basically a shell company operating inside the Trump campaign that over the course of hundreds of millions of dollars worth of spending, they just haven't provided information about the true sources of where that money is going. And it's sort of a basic tenant of campaigns and transparency at the federal government level that the public is supposed to know ultimately who's getting paid by donations, political donations that are being given. So the argument here is over what Donald Trump is going to have to reveal or not reveal. Hey, whether it's Donald Trump's taxes, whether it's his political money, he doesn't like to reveal any more than he possibly mm -hmm. has to. But this is also to just one of probably about eight or nine different areas of points of political peril that have turned into legal peril for Donald Trump. Criminal matters, civil matters, federal, state, local matters. We've got, of course, 
impeachment that's coming up, but there are all these other court fights that Donald Trump could potentially face or fights in regulatory agencies like the Federal Election Commission, which is the venue that we're talking about right now. All this is gonna play out not over a matter of months, but for years to come, perhaps for the rest of Donald Trump's life, there's gonna be a massive Mm -hmm. legal hangover that he is going to have to deal with in one way or another involving his politics, his business, his taxes, you name it. Donald Trump is gonna have to face up to it. Uh, He will. I have a question for you though, because you've done obviously a lot of reporting on Donald Trump and the legal challenges against him, holding him accountable. Are you prepared for potentially a couple more years of that? Is that something that you're excited for or at least willing to do? Well, I, you know, as reporters, we don't have any choice. We're, we're going to be in this kind of bizarre world where the Trump administration has ended. It was a singular administration, and we've never experienced anything like this as a country. Definitely, as a political reporter, we've never experienced anything like it. Joe Biden, we can just see in the first few days of his administration that the style, the tone, the tenor, the approach to government, everything is different. Okay, but Donald Trump is not going away, and it would be journalistic malpractice to just simply ignore Donald Trump as much as a lot of people would love to ignore Donald Trump and just say, ah, you know, he doesn't matter anymore. I mean, he can run for president again. Okay, he's going to be doing things in the public domain that have to be. uh, He's a former president, so we are absolutely Mm -hmm. going to continue to watchdog Donald Trump while also doing our jobs and reporting on the issues of the moment with the Biden administration coming in and a new Congress. That was a lot to handle, but I already look forward to your future reporting on the inevitable financial scandals of the Patriot Party. So we'll definitely have talks about that. For those watching, Dave's work is available on Business Insider about both of the topics that we talked about today. And as always, Dave Loventhal, thank you so much for joining us. Hey, I appreciate it, John, thank you. Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Damage Report. Support our work, listen ad-free, access members-only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, John Adarola. I'll see you soon.